Uh, I'm going to speak about the uh, research report that we released yesterday regarding the relationship between employer superannuation contributions and wage growth in Australia's uh, labour market. And uh, the full paper is available on our website there. I encourage you to go and uh, see the uh, full paper as well as some of the media coverage in some of the papers uh, yesterday. My presentation will go through the, the following steps. Number one, I'm going to give a little bit of the context for how this discussion about the relationship between superannuation contributions and wages came about. I'll talk about the argument that has been presented by some analysts and commentators, namely the idea that higher superannuation contributions as planned in the uh, scheduled increases to the SGE rate will automatically suppress wage growth. So workers are going to basically pay with one pocket for everything they get from the other pocket. Uh, so we'll review that argument and the evidence that has been brought to bear in, in support of that argument. Then I'll do a review of published economic literature, both theoretical and empirical, to see what other economists have had to say about this subject. And then I'll look at the Australian statistical evidence. We'll go back and look at the trends in superannuation contribution rates in Australia and the relationship, if any, that is available or visible to uh, rates of wage growth over that same period. And then I'll conclude with uh, a bit on what the implications of this research are and the policy uh, conclusions uh, arising from it. So the context, the reason why this debate has kind of suddenly flared up is uh, Australia has been grappling with a very, very difficult period uh, in the labour market and the realm of wage increases. Uh, Australian wages have been growing at the slowest sustained pace since the end of the Second World War. Uh, a clear structural break in wage determination uh, became evident after 2013. Since that point, nominal wages have been growing about 2% per year. That's about half the traditional pace that we would expect uh, given uh, Australia's economy, productivity trends, uh, inflation policy, uh, and so on. At 2%, that means real wages are barely keeping up with consumer price inflation, and that means that real wage increases, the actual purchasing power of working people, have hit a wall and there have been zero average real wage increases uh, since 2013. Um, and that means that a gap between real wages, the compensation that workers get, and real labor productivity, the output that workers produce, that gap's been around for quite a while, actually, but it's widened substantially because now there's no real wage increases at all and productivity growth uh, continues to, uh, to plug along. Not stellar by any uh, definition, but it's still growing. Uh, and real wages uh, are not. And in fact, uh, things are getting worse, not better, in terms of the outlook uh, for wage increases. And some of the uh, uh, prognostications and forecasts from the government and others uh, who said this is a temporary problem, don't worry, the market will take care of it, uh, are becoming uh, more and more uh, far-fetched uh, with each passing uh, week. The impact of a deceleration in wage growth to barely meet consumer price inflation means uh, real wage growth has stopped. And this is a dramatic historical change from the traditional expectation in Australia that real wages, real living standards would grow in line with productivity and economic development. And that's the whole idea of inclusive growth and a fair go. Uh, the idea that yes, we will work together to build a stronger economy. <coughs> And the industry super funds play a crucial role in that, but the benefits have to be shared if in fact we're going to preserve that social contract. And that has not been the case. There's been no growth on average in real weekly earnings since 2013. Uh, and that has occurred despite the ongoing forward march of productivity. So productivity growth has not been stellar in Australia in the last couple of years, but it still has been positive. And that means that the long-standing wedge between labor productivity and real wages that actually dates back decades uh, has widened dramatically because now real wages aren't growing at all and productivity continues to grow. This is very important for discussing the issue of the relationship between superannuation contributions and wages because the claim that somehow there's just a fixed amount of you know, goodies in the economy that can be paid to labor as compensation and anything more that goes to super has to come out of something else uh, is economically false when we see the enormous wedge of surplus output that is represented by that continuing gap between labor productivity and what workers uh, actually get paid. Into this situation of a rather dismal outlook for wage growth in Australia comes a new uh, argument and uh, we're hearing it in a way from some unexpected quarters who have suddenly discovered a great compassion for the lot of the hard-working Australian uh, whose uh, wages have not been growing. Uh, 
Uh, they concede that wage growth is very low. They then say, here is the solution. Cancel future increases that have been agreed upon in the superannuation contribution uh, uh, schedule and that will strengthen wage growth and you'll get paid that way anyways. Um, in fact, they say, workers don't need that superannuation uh, in, in retirement anyways, according to their simulations. Uh, therefore, uh, give yourself a wage increase and you'll give yourself a wage increase with your own money by taking out of one pocket uh, your retirement income and putting it into your other pocket, which is your current income. So, the specific hypothesis, if I was to put this in economic jargon, is that labor market forces will automatically adjust to any changes in compulsory employer contributions that are legislated by policy. Uh, labor markets will cause those uh, additional costs to be offset through um, automatic self-adjustments uh, in a flexible wage. Uh, leaving the total bundle of labor costs uh, unchanged because that in assumption is determined by supply and demand and therefore the incidence of any increase in those costs is shifted onto workers. So this is kind of a precise way that economists using their own language will uh, express this kind of elaborate uh, hypothesis. Most people aren't going to really understand what the heck that means so let's try putting it in uh, somewhat more common language terms. What that actually means, okay, is number one if you cut your super, you'll get a wage increase. So that's the argument that's being made here. Go to your employers and say, don't bother paying so much into my superannuation fund, and then the market will automatically deliver you a wage increase that offsets the, the relief that you've just given to your employer. So already that's starting to sound just a tad far-fetched for anybody who has any real-world experience with trying to negotiate wage increases and understanding how wage increases actually happen. But it gets better. It also implies that people who do not receive superannuation benefits automatically already are receiving higher wages. That is to say, the employers have said, this poor little person makes so little, I'm going to increase their wages by 10%. I honestly, that's very, very far-fetched to say that. And this is an important counter to the argument that we're hearing more and more that low-income people should be allowed to opt out of super in order to get higher wage increases as a result. There's already 350,000 very low-income people who've opted out of super. If, in fact, their wages grew, they would probably bounce back above the $450 threshold and start to collect super again. Uh, another uh, ha uh, corollary hypothesis is that employers are indifferent about the rate of contributions to the superannuation system because market forces will automatically ensure total labor compensation is fixed at some level and to the employer it doesn't matter whether you pay it into super or pay it out in wages. In fact, there's some benefits to the employer paying it into super because you only pay it once a quarter by law instead of every week or two. So, uh, now do we think that employers don't care about what the level of superannuation uh, requirements are? You know, if I look back at the history of um, how superannuation came about, employers had tremendous fears and opposition to it. I, I saw quotes from the Master Builders Association encouraging its members to go to the barricades to stop this scourge called compulsory super. Now, you know, enlightened employers today understand why superannuation is essential and are part of the solution here. But the idea that they don't care how much they actually have to pay is nonsense, uh, historically and, uh, and factually. Finally, this is a good one. Uh, this is also an implication of the theory. It doesn't matter who pays the contributions in, in a statutory sense. Ultimately, they're paid by the, the workers in the form of lower wages anyway. And, uh, you know, I ask you to go down to George Street here today and try to find one person walking by in the next hour who would accept this hypothesis. If you went to your employer today and said, listen, don't pay my super anymore, I'll pay it out of my wages, does anyone actually think they'd be no worse off than a situation where the employer is paying it today? No one is going to believe that. And, and nor should they, frankly, because this is a far-fetched uh, economic uh, theories. Now one of the places we've heard this argument is a, a long-standing bastion of support for workers and labor rights and that is the Center for Independent Studies. We know that they care deeply about workers because of their views on the minimum wage. They think it should be abolished. Their views on the penalty rates, they think they should be abolished. 
their views on trade unions. They think they should be abolished, okay? But suddenly, the Center for Independent Studies has discovered deep concern for uh, workers who are suffering from very historically weak wage growth, and they have argued that uh, it would be relieved a bit, anyways, if we canceled the proposed increases in uh, superannuation guarantee and made super optional. Uh, starting with low-income workers or starting with young people, but ultimately they don't like the compulsory superannuation system, period. <coughs> so this is a presentation or a, 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 a research report from the Center for Independent Studies that went through and actually simulated and calculated in their judgment how much wage people are going to lose as a result of the assumption that wages will automatically fall in order to offset the impact on employer labor costs of any increase in the superannuation guarantee rate. And they've done some incredibly detailed work here, folks. I mean, we are, we are down to 25 cents and 50 cents increments here in terms of indicating how much people at each income level are going to lose in wages because of the increase in the superannuation guarantee. And they've helpfully calculated on a before tax and an after tax basis and the difference depends on what your marginal tax rate uh, would be. So this is very detailed, very concrete, very numerical. Uh, one little footnote down there at the bottom, the whole thing depends on the assumption that the impact of the superannuation guarantee increase is fully passed through as lower wages. So uh, this is not research, this is a <coughs> numerical game where if you assume that that is going to happen, then you can calculate helpfully how much each group is going to lose as a result. And uh, it's there in living color and quantitative detail, but that doesn't mean it's research and it certainly doesn't constitute evidence. It's a, a purely invented simulation. Uh, another place where we're hearing this argument, an influential place, has been, of course, from the research lately from the Grattan Institute and their whole report, which dismisses the idea that workers even need more superannuation uh, income in retirement. They say everyone's going to be all right. And they come up with the conclusion, based on that original hypothesis, that workers will actually be worse off if their employers pay more in superannuation guarantee. Because first of all, they'll lose the full amount in lower wages, and the interaction of that with other features of the tax and transfer system, including the indexation of the age benefit, age pension benefit to average wages and so on, means you'll actually end up worse off uh, at the end of the day. So again, this is very counterintuitive and a bit of a stretch uh, to believe. Um, they at least didn't put this in a footnote, the assumption of a full one-to-one -one offset. They put it in the actual text of the paper on page 112. Uh, they uh, acknowledged uh, that uh, they assume, they simply assume wage growth is reduced by the amount of the increase in the super guarantee, instantaneously and fully. So in any given year that the superannuation guarantee goes up by half a percentage point, wage growth goes down by half a percentage point. Interesting, they're still looking at a world of 3.5% annual wage increases. I like that world, okay? They're obviously drinking from the same Kool-Aid as whoever did the Commonwealth budget wage forecasts here, okay? But uh, this is the argument uh, that they're making and they have simply asserted it. And uh, they acknowledge in the text on page 112 that they're simply asserting it. If you got through the first 111 pages of the report, uh, then you could uh, get to this. Again, most people uh, in either case are not going to understand the economic niceties of it and the theoretical assumptions that go into it. They are just going to say, wow, some important economists have put hard numbers on this claim that we're going to lose wages as a result of uh, improving super and the hard numbers are simply asserted. Nowhere in here is there uh, empirical evidence to support this assertion of a one-to-one -one trade off The groups that are citing it as evidence against the agreed schedule for increases in the SG rate are simply citing themselves, each other, and other people who think the same way. And just because you get a group of people together in a kind of groupthink situation who all feel the same way, doesn't make it true, necessarily. So uh, we have to do uh, a little bit more digging deeper. Uh, let's take a closer look at a couple of the uh, particular citations. One is the Henry Tax Review that came out in 2009, a full overview of the tax system and recommendations. Um, an important work, not the Bible, okay? Just because it's in the Henry Tax Review doesn't mean that it's true. Uh, the Henry Tax Review has a generic 
the assert assertion that employers will bear the cost of superannuation contributions through lower wage growth. They do not put a number on that. They do not explicitly say it's a one-to-one -one trade off and they do not provide any empirical research in their own work to justify why that would be the case. But it's a general statement, there's no numbers on it, and they don't do their own empirical research to justify it. They did have an interesting discussion, a more detailed discussion elsewhere in the Henry Tax Review about the impact of payroll taxes generally on wages and employment. And in fact, that is a much more nuanced and equivocal statement from the Henry Tax Review, where they say that the incidence, the final incidence of payroll taxes depends on all kinds of factors, including the flexibility of labor supply, the flexibility of labor demand, uh, and other situations, and list a number of scenarios where the incidence of payroll taxes does not fully uh, or even at all fall on workers. So I don't think the citation of the Henry Tax Review as either the final word or even as saying what they think it's saying or claim that it's saying uh, is uh, legitimate. Same goes, I think, for the constant references we've seen to Paul Keating. And uh, we know what uh, the Prime Minister, the former Prime Minister's views are on the superannuation guarantee. Absolutely thinks it has to uh, increase. That's been part of his vision from the beginning. But they're trying to turn his own words against him by selectively pulling out different bits, like a letter to the editor of the Australian Financial Review. But Keating was obviously describing a historical incident, a, a well-known and important chapter of Australia's economic and political history, which was the Accords and how they came about. And absolutely, the whole system of the Accords was based on trying to win the voluntary agreement of unions for a program of wage restraint, but there would be compensating offsets to that, including the introduction of universal superannuation, but other stuff too, the introduction of Medicare, improvements in social uh, income supports, and so on. So it was part of a package, absolutely. But was it an automatic market mechanism that means every dollar in super comes out of wages? Nonsense. Uh, it was a proactive, deliberate policy choice uh, at that moment in history. And that was a moment in history when, remember, inflation was high, as high as 15% when the whole thing started. And the general view was that wages were too high. Now we could have a debate about whether that was true or not, but that was certainly the general view that wages were too high in Australia and it was hurting Australia's economic growth. Uh, and so this package of wage restraint in return for other stuff was their vision of how to solve that problem. Does that apply today? No one can possibly argue that there's a wages overhang in Australia today. If anything, it's a wages underhang, as the evidence suggests. And the idea that now, in this environment, we should somehow cookie cutter what happened in the Accords and do it again to accept lower wages in return for modest improvements in superannuation, doesn't wash. We don't even have the institutional architecture to do an accord, right? So this idea that that somehow proves that there's a one-to-one -one trade off, uh, absolutely wrong. One other uh, piece of evidence to look at a little bit more closely is the claim that the Fair Work Commission will reduce wage increases to offset any improvements in the superannuation guarantee. And um, Grattan in particular has emphasized the 2013 and 2014 minimum wage decisions of the commission where there's a generic wording that says the commission took those modest increases in the super guarantee rate, it was 0.25% in each of those years, took them into account in defining what the minimum wage award was going to be that year. They explicitly did not put a quantum on that. In fact, they explicitly said it would be inappropriate to put a quantum on it. They explicitly rejected a mechanistic calculation. They explicitly said we won't take a wage increase and subtract 0.25, okay? And what's more is when you actually look at the wage increases that came down those two years, regardless of the generic language that was in the award, it's actually hard to see that there was any trade-off let alone a one-to-one trade-off. So this graph uh, is an interesting little puzzle. This shows the minimum wage increases in, uh, awarded by the Commission in each of the last nine years. And I've redacted the years at the bottom so you can't tell which ones were the two in question in 2013 and 14. And if you just looked at it, it's hard to say, well, what were the two years that the minimum wage was re re repressed in order to offset the extra cost <coughs> of the SG rate? Uh, and in fact, it's those two. A clever person could have started at 2019 and counted back, okay, but I won't hold that against you. That's 2013 and 2014. 2013's was a little bit lower than the average. 2014's was a bit above the average. Neither of them really stand out from the general pattern of wa uh, minimum wage increases that have been awarded over that period. So 
hard to see in actual concrete historical evidence, apart from the generic wording in their commission's decisions, that in fact there was a one-to-one -one trade off there uh, at all. Let's talk a little bit about, about what the economic literature, published economic literature, has to say about the relationship between compulsory employer contributions for social benefits like retirement or workers' compensation or unemployment insurance in other countries and the impact on wages, employment, and other labor market outcomes. And I don't want to get too much into the weeds uh, of uh, the kind of economic theories and the charts and graphs, but it's important to understand that existing economic literature, even very conventional, conservative, market-oriented economic literature, does not, in, except in a couple of very narrow spe uh, special cases, does not expect an automatic one-to-one -one trade off between compulsory employer contributions and lower wages. In the full paper that you can read, it, it'll be great bedtime reading for you for the next uh, month or so, 90 full pages of glory. Anyone who has insomnia, get the paper and read this detail uh, on the theory. We go through different theoretical approaches to the question. We also review the empirical literature. There have been hundreds of studies that economists have made of the impact of employer social contributions and payroll taxes on wages and employment, and there's no consensus uh, in that literature. We could start with the most restrictive approach to laboring, to modeling the labor market, which would be a conventional, classical, neoclassical uh, neo competitive situation, where you've got all kinds of assumptions that the wage is determined by a process of market clearing, unemployment doesn't exist, workers are paid perfectly according to their productivity, and excess profits do not exist because perfect competition ensures there's no excess profits uh, anywhere. A bizarre world, no relationship to reality. Even in that theory, this idea of an automatic one-to-one -one trade off is not expected, except in two very, uh, very special cases, one of perfectly inelastic labor supply and one of perfect substitution in the individual workers' minds between the savings that are set aside through a policy regime like Universal Super and the savings that they would have set aside anyway as an individual voluntary saver. If those two happen to align perfectly and or if you have perfectly inelastic labor supply, then you can make the case. So apologies to anyone who had to study Economics 101 at university. You're probably going to experience some PTSD here uh, for a moment while I go through the typical model okay, of a well-behaved labor demand curve, well-behaved labor supply curve, the point of ecstasy or nirvana in the middle where the curves meet and the price is determined and unemployment doesn't exist and everyone is paid according to their productivity. That's the starting point and I don't accept that starting point. But I'm saying even in that starting point, the one-to-one -one expectation isn't there. Conventionally, you would say a payroll tax or a required cost for the employer will result in a downward shift of labor demand because employers will now not hire people as, as many as they would before because they've now got the extra cost in addition to the wage. And in the general case, that will lead to some reduction in employment and some reduction in the wage. Not a one-to-one -one in the general case. In a very special case of perfectly inelastic labor supply, that's where you get the one-to-one -one effect. Perfectly inelastic labor supply in common English means workers are going to work no matter how little they're paid. Okay? It sort of describes the labor market of the pharaoh's pyramid building operation in ancient Egypt. Okay? That is to say you're going to work no matter how badly you're paid. It does not describe the real world. The reality is, of course, workers have labor supply decisions that respond to many things, including uh, wages. So in this case, you could get a full one-to-one -one relationship. Another special case is where the individual worker sees the money that's going into their super account as absolutely identical to what they would have done with the money on their own. Perfect substitutability. Also unrealistic. The fact is we have a compulsory universal super system precisely because people don't voluntarily save enough in order to support themselves in retirement. Those are two cases, even in the rarefied world of perfectly competitive neoclassical thinking where the one-to-one -one trade off would occur. In the real world, of course, it's very different. The labor market does not clear. Unemployment is a normal feature of the labor market. That means the wage is determined by something else. It's not determined by market clearing. It's determined by other things, including rules, regulations, institutions, social norms, collective bargaining, and in that world, you cannot assume that the labor market will naturally and automatically adjust 
to a change in the labor costs facing employers in such a way as to perfectly offset that in the form of lower wages. Simplest example, a minimum wage. If you have a minimum wage that binds in the sense that it's above the so-called market clearing rate, then you'll have no change in wages in response to an employer contribution because the wage has to stay at the minimum level, assuming that employers are following the law, which sometimes is wishful thinking, okay? But assuming the minimum wage is in effect, then you will get, in this conventional neoclassical model, a reduction in employment, but you won't get any changes in the wage itself, and you can have policy responses to the change in employment uh, to try to make sure you're creating jobs at the same time as you're uh, supporting a minimum wage. In this world, the one-to-one -one relationship doesn't exist. In fact, there's no relationship. Well, frankly, that world is a lot closer to Australia's reality than the neoclassical, perfectly competitive market clearing story. Uh, this shows how pay is set in Australia. Anything that's a shade of red has something that's regulated or, or influenced by policy. Anything that's blue is more market dependent. You've got people who are paid the minimum wage. You've got people who are paid uh, the award. You've got people paid according to enterprise agreements. You've even got a fair share of people who are covered by indivi individual contracts whose wages basically mirror what happens in the awards. The research shows that at least a quarter of people on individual contracts are basically getting paid according to the award. So two-thirds of Australians have their wages directly set by policy and institutions, not by the so-called market. So in that case, the idea of a market clearing adjustment is quite wrong. If you allow for all of these real world factors, you know, the conventional economists call them market failures or imperfections, I would call it real life, okay? I don't start from the neoclassical perspective as an economist. But when you add in all of these different things, the story changes dramatically. And you cannot assume a one-to-one -one relationship remotely. In fact, you don't necessarily assume any relationship. You have a situation where wages are determined by all of these institutional and regulatory and normative and political factors, and those are the same factors that are at work on determining what the superannuation guarantee rate is going to be. That's a whole political, institutional, regulatory discussion that we're having there. So there's no offset. In fact, the two could very much go in the same direction. And the review of hundreds of empirical studies finds the same thing. There's no consensus at all. There's a wide range of outcomes. Let me take the last few minutes to talk about the Australian evidence. There's no correlation in any given year between when the super guarantee rate was raised and what happened to wages. Uh, uh, different ways that we show that in the full report. This, in a way, is uh, the most kind of intuitive. We've just said there's two types of years. There's a year in which the super guarantee was increased and a year in which the super guarantee was not increased. Um, there's two broad categories of wage growth. You're doing better than average or you're doing worse than average. Let's make a little matrix, a simple matrix, that compares those co permutations and combinations. And in fact, there is evidence in every single one of those combinations. There's years in which the super guarantee rate was frozen, but wages were weaker than average. There's years in which the superannuation guarantee was raised, and wages were stronger than average, and vice versa. Uh, in general, it's about an even split in years uh, where there was no increase, and that's what you would expect. That's the nature of an average. It kind of s splits uh, down the middle. In terms of when superannuation was increased, it was twice as likely that wage growth would be above average as it would be below average. So immediately you're getting some simple doubt cast on the assumption that there'll be a one-to-one trade-off. If you just average it across the whole period, on average, wage growth was somewhat higher in years when the super guarantee rate was increased. I wouldn't tell a causation story to go with this. I'm not saying that increasing the superannuation guarantee automatically means you're going to get higher wages. I wouldn't go there. Um, I could tell a story as to why the two tend to go together. You know, if wages are determined by institutions and bargaining power, well, when workers have bargaining power, they tend to go after superannuation as well as wages. So you could see why there's a correlation, but I don't think the one causes the other. Uh, we did a more sophisticated or complete analysis using, uh, dusted off the old uh, econometric uh, techniques and looked at the other factors that also influence wages at the same time, rather than just doing the simple bivariate correlation between superannuation changes and wages. And we looked at the whole slate of determinants of wage growth, including inflation expectations, the unemployment rate, the terms of trade, which are very important in Australia's economy because of the resource industry and the uh, fluctuations in resource prices. 
changes in the minimum wages uh, and so on. Uh, we developed a base case model to explain the ups and downs of wage growth and then we said do the changes in the superannuation guarantee that occurred at different points in time add to that story? Do they have any significance? Uh, the answer in general was not. There generally wasn't significance but the sign on the relationship such as it was was opposite to what is expected in the CIS and Grattan claims. In other words, we found evidence of a weak positive association between superannuation guarantee changes and the rate of wage growth, not an op op offsetting uh, trade-off. And in some cases, and uh, depending on how you specified the equation, it was actually statistically significant. So certainly no evidence to support the assumption <coughs> that that trade-off uh, is there. And interesting evidence to say maybe things are working quite a bit differently. We also looked at the history of wage growth and superannuation changes across industries in Australia, and this is an interesting way to sort of take advantage of variation in the data to see if there's any kind of correlation. The universal super rate is, is the same across the whole economy, of course, 9.5%, but the effective rate differs from one industry to another depending on various factors, including how many people fall under the monthly threshold, how many people fall above the maximum threshold, how many people are in industries where their unions have negotiated superannuation above and beyond the 9.5% minimum? How, many, how much work in an industry is overtime, which doesn't normally incur superannuation uh, contribution? So all of those factors means there's quite a variation in the incidence of, uh, the effective incidence of superannuation contributions across industries. So we said, where was it at the starting point in 2012, 2013, before the first of those two little increases? And how have wages grown in each industry since then? According to the story, if you had higher superannuation guarantee costs, you should have had lower wage growth. But there's no pattern at all. We plot the industries there. The, the trend line, such as it is, is a flat line. And there are some industries in the upper right corner of the um, graph where they started with a higher super rate, so they've had more cost from the increases, but they've actually had higher wage growth since. That's health and community services and education. Those are the sectors where above 9.5% super is most common and where wage growth has been the strongest. There's other industries like construction and mining where the effective super rate was lower, mostly because of heavy overtime, but wage growth has been weaker in that period. So. On an inter-industry basis, no evidence. Internationally, you can also look at it because, of course, superannuation <coughs> is an Australian thing, but the phenomenon of compulsory employer social contributions happens all over the place. And we could look at the, both the level of wages adjusted for productivity and the rate of change of wages and compare that to the level of payroll taxes on employers and changes in the level of payroll taxes on employers and we get the same result. It's a scatter plot. Uh, in fact, in this case, the trend line, which is not significant, is slightly positive, which means, again, countries where payroll taxes went up, on average, had slightly higher wage growth, not weaker. So across the board, uh, you don't have uh, evidence to support the assertion of a one-to-one -one negative trade-off between superannuation guarantee payments and wage growth. In the historical data, if anything, there's a slight positive uh, correlation Nowhere do we find evidence to support the Grattan and CIS assumption of a full one-to-one -one negative trade-off. The claim that is baked into the Grattan and CIS simulations that wages will fully and instantaneously fall to offset any increase in superannuation guarantees is false. That claim should be rejected and policy analysis that's based on that assertion uh, should be uh, rejected. Now. If I take my more nuanced, sort of uh, real-world approach to this issue, I would argue that wages and labor compensation in general is determined not by market clearing, but by things like institutions, policies, regulations, bargaining power, social pressure. In that world, um, is there any trade-off between the two? Potentially there could be, but it isn't inevitable and it isn't automatic. Um, it could be that if we ever got to a point where workers were actually pushing the limit 
where workers were actually demanding compensation that was up to and maybe beyond what employers could actually pay and stay in business. Then you might get a situation where you say, well guys, we've got to choose one or the other. How much wages are we going to go for versus how much soup? Um, until we get there, there's no particular reason why workers couldn't demand and win both. Again, it won't happen automatically. It's not driven by the market. It's driven by regulations and policies and institutions. Uh, if we ever got to that trade-off, then, then uh, we could have that discussion. And that might be where we were at in the 80s when the prices and income accords were brought into place. That's clearly not where we're at today. Those two components of labor compensation, your current income and your uh, retirement security, are mostly independent and they could go in the same direction as easily as they go in opposite directions because they reflect uh, separate policy choices. So if we're concerned about wages in Australia, and we should be, I suggest let's fix wages, okay? And we know what to do on the basis of policy research that's been done, the changes that could happen in minimum wages, the way the awards work, revitalizing collective bargaining, changing government fiscal policy so that it's consistent with that dreamed of rebound in wage growth, rather than continuing to suppress wage growth in the public sector and publicly funded uh, social services. If we're concerned about wages, let's do that. Giving up your super is not going to fix wages. You should not have one iota of confidence that by abandoning the bipartisan scheduled agreement to raise superannuation, to strengthen the retirement security uh, of workers after they retire, don't have one iota of faith that giving that up will put more money in your pocket today. There's absolutely no reason uh, to believe that. And given how the economy has unfolded, how wages have lagged so far behind productivity growth, Australia can absolutely afford to do both.